that word ecology is actually central to what I'm going to talk about tonight. Uh, I should make one correction. I, I'm not the founder of the Willow Bank program. And in fact, Shelley Houston, who's here, has been at Willow Bank since the beginning of the program, and uh, it's to her that we owe the program. But I, I did join Willow Bank about five years ago when we had no graduates. It was still a hypothetical idea. So uh, I want to talk about our approach at Willow Bank to the historic urban landscape. And I use that term, UNESCO has just adopted this recommendation on historic urban landscapes. And a way it's taking the idea of cultural landscape and applying it to the urban context. Uh, I might also say at the beginning that cultural landscapes in our mind are not historic landscapes. Historic landscapes are landscapes that have acquired historic significance. But the word cultural, uh, we use to describe landscapes that exist in the cultural imagination. And so cultural landscapes, have to be experienced to be understood. A uh, historic landscape can be observed, but you can't actually observe a cultural landscape. It exists in the cultural imagination, and different cultural groups may occupy the same physical space, but be inhabiting different cultural landscapes. And one of the great things about cities is when you can have cultural landscapes that overlay on top of each other, and multiple realities, cultural realities that exist in the same place. And one of the reasons for using the word ecology is that ecology is about relationships and diversity in, ecolo in ecological settings is a very healthy aspect of, of cities. I'm going to start, and some of you have seen some of these images, but I, I like to start here because it explains, I guess, where we're coming from. People who get involved in the conservation field, and I'm going to speak about the cultural resource conservation field. But in fact, the natural resource conservation field has a lot of parallels. I'm just going to take you in five minutes through a 300-year history. But the first three of these, the antiquarian bias, the commemorative bias, and the aesthetic bias, all relate to objects. And the 20th century was kind of the culmination of our obsession with the object as a way of understanding the world, classifying it, sorting it. Universities and museums are the two, to me, stereotypical modernist institutions of the 20th century both of which I think are going to struggle a bit in the 21st century. But they were about objects, whether it was knowledge being bound and put into a library, whether it was objects being put in on display. The ecological bias is not about objects, it's about the relationship between objects. So if we start with the antiquarian bias, in the 18th century we had all these archaeological surveys of, uh, in the UK, but in Egypt, in Iraq, in India, Sri Lanka, Mexico, and many of these archaeological surveys are still the National Historic Site agencies in those countries. Archaeologists are fascinated with the remnants, the physical remnants of earlier civilizations. And from those remnants, they will spin great stories of cultural inhabitation of, of place. The first scheduled monuments act, which was in the UK, uh, the only way a monument could be inscribed on the schedule, which made them a designated site, was if they were vacant. So ruins were what uh, were put on the site, or vestiges of earlier civilizations. An inhabited site wasn't eligible for inscription. And one thing about archaeologists is that they really value the actual, tangible, physical remains, because it's from sometimes those very fragile artifacts that you can spin great stories about cultures, about food patterns, about movement patterns, construction methods, the way people inhabited place. This is an 18th century engraving in India and in South India where I, I grew up, uh, my childhood was partly in Montreal but partly in India, uh, done by the Archaeological Survey of India. Uh, and these temples uh, that you see in the background uh, were studied by archaeologists in enormous detail to capture uh, patterns from 2,000, 3,000 years ago. Stuart and Revit in 1788, so in the 18th century, published this book called The Antiquities of Athens, which was the first very careful measured drawings of a historic place, beautiful copper plate engravings. The lower engraving shows the reconstructed Parthenon, but the upper one was their image of what the Parthenon looked like. Because for archaeologists, it was the ruin that contained all the information that they could glean from the site. And they weren't about to reconstruct the Parthenon because then it would no longer be an archaeological site, it would be something else. But then we get into this next phase of commemorative bias, which I date to 
1855 in establishing the Ladies Auxiliary of Mount Vernon, which was this group of women who realized that George Washington's estate, Mount Vernon, was about to be sold and said, we've got to buy this and preserve it for the American people. This home of George Washington represents for us the home of our most important political leader. And at Mount Vernon, we can tell the story of George Washington, but also the birth of the nation. And that's a very different motive for protecting a historic place. And this is Mount Vernon today, which receives millions of visitors a year. And in this case, there are reconstructions. The blacksmith shop was just reconstructed two years ago to complete what is, in a sense, a stage set for telling the history, in this case, of the US. So the commemorative bias has a very different attitude to historic places. They become a place to tell a story. And it's not as important whether the material itself carries the story. If you do that investigation, you then, in a sense, build these stage sets. And I would say Parks Canada and the US Park Service are still primarily involved in this commemorative bias when they deal with historic sites. This is Fort Anne, the very first National Historic Site in Canada, as it was when the citizens in that part of the world petitioned the federal government to protect this site because of its importance to Canadian history. And in this photo, you can see what I would call an archaeological site. That building in the background is a, a timber frame building with um, 18th century wood siding on it. This Fort Anne today, and that's the same building, uh, that siding is concrete panel siding, which Parks at some point decided was easier to maintain than the, <laughs> the wood. And for an archaeologist, you, if you replace the concrete, I mean the, the wood with concrete, you've, it's no longer of significance archaeologically. But as a commemorative site, Parks is still able to tell the story of Fort Anne and actually add a lot of other layers to it. Then we get what I consider the 20th century bias, which has become very, very dominant in the field. And that's the aesthetic bias of being involved in the field. And this I date to another US site, William Colonial Williamsburg, which started, interestingly enough, as a commemorative site. But it was fairly conjectural. There was a copper plate engraving of this building, one copper plate engraving in the Oxford Library that they used to reconstruct the whole building. But what they realized after they started to work on this with a lot of Rockefeller money was that there was an enormous aesthetic appreciation for the 18th century. And from rebuilding these buildings, they went on to build hotels, uh, guest houses, retail stores, all in this 18th century vocabulary and created a whole environment of the 18th century, including the landscape and the streetscape and so on. And you can now buy Williamsburg wallpapers, paint colors, um, plans, and this whole style of architecture has become very popular because of Colonial Williamsburg. It also had huge uh, economic spin-offs in the region. So you see that bias. This is Upper Canada Village. Peter John Stokes was very involved in this, and he'll say very openly that he admires the architecture of the early 19th century in Upper Canada up to about 1860. And after that, the aesthetics just go downhill, and the whole Victorian period is something he sort of closes his eyes and hopes he doesn't have to see it too much. And he will openly admit that Upper Canada Village is about what he considers a, a really pure state of design in Upper Canada, and one that had great strength. And it is a pre-Confederation site, and it extended from the buildings into the landscape and gardens. This is the first heritage conservation district in Canada, uh, Gastown in Vancouver. This is a before picture. That fish and chips on the right was actually quite uh, popular as a local hangout. And this is Gastown after it became a designated heritage conservation district. And you can see the aesthetic bias at work here. The storefront messiness has been removed. The original Victorian facades have been exposed, and they've been painted to their Victorian colors. There was a signage bylaw put into effect, which called for very strict controls on the color of lettering and so on. And in fact, if you can't really see it in this photo, but there's uh, herringbone brick paving covering that whole plaza, which comes directly from Colonial Williamsburg, as do the cast iron street lamps, the bollards, and everything else, which have become almost part of the aesthetic vocabulary of what a proper heritage conservation district is supposed to look like. This is a poster that uh, Heritage Canada used to put out a poster every uh, Heritage Day in February. And this is a one from the early 80s, which had no caption to it. This was considered sufficient to draw new members to the heritage movement. And 
if there's any doubt that this is appealing to an aesthetic bias, I, I think there's no other explanation for it. Do you want something beautiful replaced by something not beautiful? This is the first design guidelines for Heritage Conservation District in Savannah. And this is four of the 14. But if you follow all 14 guidelines, all you can do is rebuild a Savannah house because by the time you get through the proportions, the size of openings and materials, the scale, the proportions, the setback, they're really saying what we don't want is a different aesthetic within this neighborhood. And design guidelines are a typical part of Heritage Conservation District. So now we come to the ecological bias, which I see as a 21st century um, motivation for people to get involved in the conservation field. And there, as you can see, I've put, you know, there are more cultural geographers and anthropologists involved in this. So a couple of things about what happened when this idea comes in. I use cultural landscapes as a way of defining what it is to think about conservation in an ecological sense. This is the first cultural landscape nominated to the UNESCO to go on the World Heritage List. And the World Heritage Committee turned it down because it didn't fit either into their cultural candidate category or their natural category. The Lake District in England, which is what this is, what was interesting about it was that not only was it a natural place and a cultural place, and it had both these values, and they felt that they were inseparable, but also they made the point that this place existed in the cultural imagination of people not only in England but around the world through poetry, through art, through novels, and so on. And I think this is a very important point that cultural landscapes are best often understood by the artist who can interpret them and express what people are actually feeling about a place. This is another project that happened about the same time, a project in Hungary which came to Parks Canada when I was there and Steve Sheridan, who was the chief planner, was Hungarian and uh, came rushing in with this. So this is a ruined site. They had very accurate drawings of what it used to look like historically and this is the restoration they did of it in which they use these stainless steel vaults and concrete uh, infill to suggest the history of the place but using contemporary design to interpret the place. So this combination of contemporary design in a historic setting was something that was at that time quite revolutionary to think of how the two might in fact carry on a conversation as opposed to being in conflict with each other. And this is uh, Les Forges de Saint-Maurice in uh, Trois-Rivières in Quebec, which is uh, a Perks Canada site, a very important archaeological site that a similar technique has been used to recreate the idea of the industrial landscape, but actually using that contemporary structure to protect the very fragile archaeological remains. And even that use of light to suggest where the fire was that uh, drove the forge. I think it's a very beautiful site. I think from the Aboriginal perspective in Canada, the linking of architecture and landscape was for them a critical uh, and kind of necessary move. And there was a series of schools done for Aboriginal communities in BC that were paid for by the Department of Indian and Northern Affairs, but under the direction of a project manager who lived in BC, and she uh, never really told Ottawa what she was up to. So this whole series of schools broke every rule that Indian and Northern Affairs had, and they fired her when they finally found out what she was up to. But she managed to create probably the best 10 schools that Indian Northern Affairs has ever done because she worked with the communities and with very good designers to in fact interpret an attitude to both architecture and landscape that I think is very significant. There was even a more significant thing that happened in Calgary at the Glenbow when they did their first, and this is I don't know, 25 years ago, their first exhibit of Aboriginal artifacts in an art gallery and they put them in beautiful glass cases and shone lights on them, and at the opening there was a protest by the Lubukan who said, you have completely misunderstood these artifacts because in fact a mask is not an artifact. The mask only becomes a cultural object when it's being danced. And if it's not being danced, you put it away. You put it out of the light and in a cupboard. And that was a comment that the gallery owners had no idea how to deal with. And the reverberations of that consternation are still being felt in the museum world today, all these years later, uh, although there have been many papers and conferences and so on on exactly this subject. But that idea that the artifact and the ritual come together to create cultural reality is, I think, what is fundamental to the idea of cultural landscapes. And in fact, at Willowbank, we often say our definition of a cultural landscape is a place where artifact and ritual 
are in a, in a kind of harmony or balance. There's another site that was submitted to the World Heritage Committee of UNESCO for designation. This is the Issei Shrine in Japan. And the reason the committee turned this one down is they said, well, it's, it's less than 20 years old. The Japanese said, well, yes, it is, because it's ritually rebuilt every 20 years. And what they do is they have an empty site beside the temple. Every 20 years, the craftsmen who built the last temple train a new generation of craftsmen to build the temple on the adjacent site. And then they dismantle the original temple. And as the Japanese pointed out, this has been going on for more than a 1,000 years. And they said to the Europeans who dominated the World Heritage Committee, we think this has cultural significance. Europeans did not to deal with this. Um, and in the end, what happened was that there was, uh, and in fact, Herb Stovall, who's a Canadian, was one of the key people to help orchestrate a group that, in the end, wrote something called the NARA Convention in NARA in Japan, which developed a new definition for cultural heritage, which included the ritual of building as part of how you understand the artifact. And they weren't quite prepared to apply that idea to Europe, but they said, well, at least in certain cultures, this seems to be important. But at least that was a step forward, and this site now has been inscribed on the World Heritage List. Again, a really important, I mean, now it may seem surprising that this would be turned down, but this ecological perspective is something that is still um, working its way through, I would say, the consciousness. This new UNESCO recommendation, which was adopted just 11 months ago, uh, you can see in some of these, I'm not going to read them, but in the first paragraph, the idea of tangible and intangible components. In the second paragraph, the shift from a primarily architectural and monumental emphasis towards recognition of social, economic, and cultural processes. And those are the rituals that actually bring a place to life. And framing urban conservation strategies within the larger goal of overall sustainable development. And this is part of the fact that in an ecological sense, natural resource conservation and cultural resource conservation and creative, current, design, contemporary design and development have to come together. And so the definition of a historic urban landscape is a settlement understood as a layering of these historical, cultural, and natural values. That's bringing these three together, extending beyond the notion of a historic center or ensemble. The cultural landscape idea is pretty, uh, kind of undermines a lot of the regulatory systems we've set up for <coughs> urban heritage, because it, it's a more dynamic view. And if you look at the next paragraph, cultural creativity as a key asset for human, social, and economic development. UNESCO is not in the habit of putting cultural creativity as an essential component of cultural heritage documents. There's been a lot more in the heritage documents about protecting historic assets as opposed to using cultural creativity to keep them alive and dynamic. And I wanted to show just three images from the World Bank. The second author here, Rish Dastur, is this young Indian who I think is a really important emerging figure. I mean, he's only in his early 30s, but uh, he did a double degree in neuroscience and religion, and then before he did his graduate work in urban planning, which I think is a pretty good background to have if you're going to find it. <laughs> and he wrote this book for the World Bank on bringing ecology and urban development together, and this Eco2 Cities program is now a significant program at the World Bank who in the past have not dealt with economic development as having anything particularly to do with ecological development. Arish is now working on bringing the cultural component into this. This is another book that Arish did that I quite like, which is the, to convince the World Bank to write a book saying we should probably look at urban slums, because if you want to really understand how natural and cultural resources are used imaginatively, creatively, creating a dynamic process where people with almost no resources, managed to create an environment where there is life, there is exchange, and so on. And basically what this book suggests is that the World Bank might invest in some things like clean drinking water and sewage in these places, but not wipe the whole thing off the face of the earth and build them high-rise apartment buildings, which is what they've been doing in some areas. This is a pretty dramatic shift for the World Bank, and this is the last one, which the other World Bank publish anything that talks about the economics of uniqueness, given their record of gradually homogenizing the whole world, is, I think, pretty important. I would say the subtitle, though, belies the fact that uh, Guido Charity, who's one of the authors here, I would say is not 
someone who really looks at cities eco ecologically, because he's still interested in that historic city core, which becomes a, a kind of frozen element within the city. So I wanted to look just a little bit at what it means to apply a cultural landscape attitude to a city. This is a city in South India, uh, Madurai, where I lived for a number of years. And when I ask people to map this city, which is a 3,000-year-old city, a very dense urban fabric with this 14-acre temple complex in the middle, uh, they came out with this drawing where the temple is in the middle and then there are these four concentric squares around it. And the reason those squares are there is that there actually is a series of processions where the deities are taken out of the temple and they you can see the squares kind of very awkward in the diagram, but in fact, continuous roots that they create this. And I think the important thing about this city is that the rituals map the city. And that's what people map because they follow these rituals. And I think that's a really important aspect of mapping cities, is that if you ask people to map a city, they will map their rituals. And through the rituals, you understand how they experience it. It's also interesting in this particular case, because right at the far left, you can see a little bit of another temple. This is a Shaivite temple in the middle, and it's a Vaishnavite temple on the left. It has its own festivals. And so it maps the city on top of the other mapping of the city. They overlay each other. Some of those festivals, the roots cross each other. There's one other interesting aspect that if you look at the temple itself in the middle, those dark four squares are the main towers on the northeast southwest. And if you take the axis between them, right in the center is the shrine of Shiva, who's a male deity. But down to the left on, on the side uh, is the shrine of Minakshi, who is the goddess of Madre. And if you look directly across from that, there's a little gate that's been added, a kind of hole in the wall. Well, everybody in Madurai comes through that gate and worships Minakshi because she's the favorite goddess of the city and, in fact, is based on an actual Pandian ruler who ruled the city uh, about 2,000 years ago, much beloved. And when you ask people to map the temple, they put Minakshi's shrine right in the middle and they push Shiva up somewhere in the north part of the compound. And they put that gate that they all come in as the primary gate on the east side. I think that's very significant because that's the real temple. That's the reality of that from a cultural perspective. And we sometimes, I, I think, get overly reliant on um, GIS systems as sort of showing us the reality. That's the physical reality, but not necessarily the perceived reality. And what we're dealing with culturally are the perceived realities. I would also say that this kind of diagram is, in fact, a diagram of that city done by an artist <coughs> who has done the four gates to the temple and shows in those circular forms the movement around the temple. And you sometimes you have to rely on other kinds of expression, particularly other than the photograph and the, uh, as I say, the GIS map, to get it at the cultural, the way communities understand place. To move to Toronto, this is a movie which I show our students, uh, created, done quite a few years ago by uh, this person, Krishnan, living in, in Toronto. An amazing view of Toronto from inside the city but a, a cultural reality that has ties, in fact, back to the city I just showed you a month ago with uh, there's one point at which there's a religious festival winding its way through the Presbyterian grid of Toronto, which is quite, quite wonderful. So I'm going to talk about some local sites. One of the things I like about Evergreen Brickworks, and it has to do with this notion of multiple occupations of space, is that one of the things that's happening at the Brickworks, I think, is that the distinction between public and private space is breaking down. And I see this generation, the young generation, as being ones that are redefining what we mean by private and public space. And that's a very healthy challenge because, in fact, we've far too long relied on property lines and legal definitions to not only talk about property rights and all that sort of thing, but how we, in fact, occupy the city. And what I like about, I think it's in this place that to the right is this place you can rent for a wedding reception or a private function. And this place we're looking at is a public park. But there's only a line of columns, so if you want to wander in and steal food off the table, you're quite welcome to do that. That's actually their most popular rentable space. And I think it's important because if you go back to, let's say, an Italian hill town where you've got a plaza in front of the temple, I mean in front of the cathedral, that's where you might have your wedding party with a local local restaurant providing the tables and chairs because people couldn't afford in your own house to have a large space for a gathering. I think the overlap of public and private space is part of, uh, in a sense, reclaiming the city. And 
It's something that I think planners are still groping with what it means to lose some of those distinctions. Uh, our students are working on Kensington Market, and Kensington Market is pretty amazing in terms of who has defined public and private space over the years, which has certainly not been according to any planning principles. Uh, also at the Witchwood Art Barns, I think what's been interesting there is that the community gardens were set up, and then cultural communities in the city, and I'm not speaking as a Torontonian, because I'm not a Torontonian, so you will know a lot more about these places than I do, but I think what, what interests me about a place like this is how the rituals of growing food have become cultural patterns, and so you now get these individual cultural communities that have developed their gardens and use the kitchens to cook food, and the ritual of growing, preparing, consuming food is one of the most important markers of how a culture inhabits a place. And the renewed interest in urban agriculture, I think, is very significant in this way. It's also interesting that, well, I'm going to talk over just at the end about zoning, which uh, is really what destroyed urban agriculture. Uh, this is a project, I think Jack Diamond is here, and this is a diamond edge. But Project, but I, I really like it because it reflects to me a new attitude. This is Deer Park United Church. The roof is a big roof. It's, it has no visible trusses inside, and the developer was allowed to stuff it full of condos and put some dormers on the roof to get some light in. And instead, they proposed taking off the roof, and instead of making it condos in private space, of making a small public park, open park within this part of the church, instead of making it private condos, even though the roof would disappear. That's very, very difficult for our regulatory system under urban cultural heritage, because it seems to be destroying the church. But I, you can look at Noli's map of Rome done in 1748, an amazing map in which he mapped the cultural landscape of Rome, and all the white spaces are the public open spaces, all the black spaces are the private spaces. People have done that for years, and still continue to do it. But what he did was the interiors of the churches are in white with the floor plan of the columns. Because he realized that the churches were part of the public realm. For the people of Rome, those churches belonged to all of them. They were free to wander into them at any time of day or night. And so he put them within the public realm and did them in plan. Even though in a map, in a aerial Google uh, satellite photo, you can't do that. So that's why I say you need people to interpret the urban landscape to actually map the cultural landscapes that exist. And I think what's happening with that proposal for Deer Park United Church is they're saying this has always been a place of refuge off the busy path of the street to find a place which is a semi-public place and we'll keep that aspect of it which is a cultural practice which gives that place cultural value. Uh, this is the Byron Market uh, which we were asked to, and it's pretty amazing, we were asked to study this place in 1989 and at that point the City of Ottawa had decided to level about 30 square blocks and leave only the cathedral and rebuild it with high-rise buildings. It's not that long ago. And what we did, some people wanted it to be a heritage conservation district, and they actually said to us in our terms of reference, we want brick sidewalks, cast iron street lamps, and cast iron bollards. And I said, well, we'll see. We need to talk to the community. These are the three maps that the community did. The one on the left shows someone who said there's some really wonderful architecture from all the periods of the 19th century and the 20th century art deco, early Victorian row houses, very simple Georgian row houses, and quite wonderful buildings from the 1950s. The middle one was done by a farmer who said these are the areas within the buyer market that I connect with the rural community. And we did hundreds of these maps. So these are in fact represent cultural groups that map certain ways. And the third map on the right was done by one of my graduate students, that's every single bar in the bar market. <laughs> that's a cultural landscape that emerges at about 10 o'clock at night, survives till 3 in the morning, and then disappears again. And, and what we said in the city is you have to maintain all these cultural landscapes layered on top of each other. They have different boundaries. Uh, they each have their own reality. And uh, so in the end, the city agreed to keep the place they also, on Dalhousie Street, where they were going to put in brick sidewalks, bury all the services, so on, we said, you, you can't do that. You have to leave them as cracked concrete sidewalks, leave the messy overhead wires, because that has always been a place where the immigrant community felt comfortable because they were low rents. And if you do that, you're going to gentrify 
you need a place that is pretty hard around the edges because you have to keep those rents low. And it's, it's still the lowest rent part of that part of Ottawa, which is pretty well gentrified, so it's not saying all that much, but the new Afghan restaurant, for example, is on Dal, Dalhousie Street. Uh, and I was called, you notice these motorcycles right at the front, I was called uh, about four years ago by the city of Ottawa to say, what did I suggest? They knew I had done a study 20 years earlier. We were getting these complaints about all these motorcycles in the market, and should we make a place for them or should we try to get rid of them? And I said, absolutely, you create a place for motorcycles. That is another cultural landscape that is going to emerge and will, in fact, work well with the teenagers who restore these old cars and go to the bar market because one of the things we said from a cultural heritage point of view, if you look at the rituals, is that chaos on the streets and conflicts between vehicles and pedestrians is absolutely critical to the character of this area. And you're not going to make the pedestrian malls out of it that you're proposing. We're going to keep pedestrian car conflict as essential. And of course, that's where you go if you just restored a Pontiac GTO and you want it. It takes you about 10 minutes just to drive around that block because you're just crawling through these crowds. That's what people love. They want that place where the pedestrian is in control, but where you still have car traffic. I would say the motorcycle people are not gangs. They're middle-aged men who are fantasizing about that. This is another example of Montreal where this is a map of Montreal that you can trace off an actual map. But this is Boulevard Saint Laurent, which you can also map. And Carleton University is doing a very detailed recording of the entire street because it's a famous street in Montreal. But really, it's not about recording. They, they're doing such a detailed recording that every brick on these buildings is being recorded. Every stone, coin, every window opening. But to me, this is the mental map of that. East Montreal, and this is a map that is drawn from a study that Patricia Smart did of Quebecois literature in English, French, and in other languages. And so this comes not from current Montreal, but uh, Montreal in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. West Montreal was English, East Montreal was French, and Boulevard Saint Laurent was the main street of the Alaphone community, where the Jewish, Portuguese, Italian communities lived, and where Mordecai Richler and others, that was their main street. What's amazing in this literature is you get this image of Saint Laurent as this boundary condition between East and West, and the perceptions of Francophone literature of that era is entirely different from the English literature, both of which speak about the same area, but in very different ways. And I think the reason Boulevard Saint Laurent is so fascinating to people is it has been this place of overlapping cultural landscapes, and those are the most fascinating parts of cities. And unfortunately, I think in this case, it's, it's beginning to disappear, that aspect. So people go there because they have this memory of it being that way. But I think it's up to us who are involved with cities to allow communities to express these ideas about place and to allow them... Uh, and this was sort of gentrified intentionally by the city rather than letting it just uh, emerge in the way it wanted to. I'm going to go through one last set of images and then we'll have some questions. Uh, one of the great advantages, I do a lot of work um, with UNESCO and also now with the World Bank. Many countries look to Canada and say, you guys have both the advantage of a culturally diverse population and an articulate Aboriginal community, Indigenous community. Your First Nations are, are willing to be part of this conversation. And there are many other countries where, particularly in Europe and some other places where they simply lack that type of conversation. And the reason it's important is the Aboriginal community has, many of them insisted for a long time that this division between culture and nature was artificial and the distinction between the physical place and the cultural practice that animates that place is also a very artificial distinction. If you just look at the mapping of Canada, and this is a map done right where Willowbank is, uh, you can see the Aboriginal landscape, which is the river edge and the valley going up in the escarpment at the bottom, being overlaid by the grid of the Europeans. And that putting the grid onto the landscape is to me a very powerful metaphorical example of gridding our world in, in a, a modernist sense. 
the French in Quebec did these river lots, which at least took the river as a starting point. And in Ontario, we had a mixture of that, where there were 100 acre parcels, but they went back from the lakeshore. But by the time you get out to the prairies, we pretty well got things under control, and everything was pretty well north, south, and east, west. And in some ways, the Riel Rebellion was as much about a fundamental uh, complaint about losing a relationship to place and to the and to the landscape that had become cultural and was being displaced by a different cultural landscape that wouldn't let the earlier one survive. So I, I just did these diagrams to talk about what I see as a shift going on. This is what I call phase one, and people will bank will hear me talk about well, they're a phase three person, which means I really admire them. <laughs> so you can put yourself as a phase one, two, or three. So this is phase one. This is when, and I'm using the yellow for natural sites and the blue for cultural sites. In the 50s and 60s, going back before that, but certainly in that period, people trying to protect wetlands from suburban development, trying to protect historic sites from urban development and clearance. And so the grid is the modernist approach to the world. Let's classify create hierarchies, create divisions of knowledge, create expertise in certain ways. And then these people who sort of put sandbags around, you know, desperately holding hands around historic buildings and so on. This is phase two, <coughs> in a very dominant phase in the 70s, 80s, 90s. We introduced legislation in Canada in every province for protecting historic resources and for protecting natural resources. We introduced Environmental Protection Acts and, and processes, uh, EA processes. We also began to train people in both the environmental field and the cultural heritage field and give them BAs and MAs, even PhDs. Uh, we created disciplines, we created a legal system where we could go to court and challenge people on their own ground. So we said, this is a system, let's become part of it. And this is when you begin to see people having initials after the name, MA and Heritage Conservation, or, whatever. or the same on the environmental side. So this is a drawing of what you could consider as cultural landscapes. So cultural landscapes are these places in the middle where culture and nature somehow come together. So it's a new typology within the heritage conservation field. And in a way, this is what UNESCO has done. And there was a conference just a few weeks ago at Rutgers, which was about this. But what happened was ECOMOS was there, UNESCO was there, but the International Union for the Conservation was there. And even more importantly, there were indigenous voices from Siberia, from Kyrgyzstan, from Ecuador, from Peru, from the US, from Turkey, from Australia. And that voice basically said, just as you think in the heritage and conservation field, whether cultural or natural, you're achieving equality with the modernist system. The modernist system itself is dissolving, and it's partly because of a new awareness of what I would call an ecological approach. And so this is, in fact, the new diagram. And so what I call the thing to protect natural resources, but how do we integrate an attitude to historic places, to natural environments, and to creative design and development that brings them together and it sees nature and culture as synonymous. And obviously, there's a heavy debt here to uh, many First Nations community. And as Michelle Poirier, who's a, a remarkable Algonquin woman, said, the problem with you guys in both the cultural and natural side is you think you're protecting nature and you're protecting culture. But the fundamental principle is that we are nature and we are culture. And that has to be the starting point. And I think this was just an attempt to say, this is the world we're getting into. The young generation, unlike my generation, is actually quite comfortable with this world and impatient to design it and make sense of it. And I don't think we have made sense of it. I don't know, think we have any idea what the regulatory systems are. But that's not so important because, in fact, the whole issue of taking everything to court, even having an OMB and so on, is part of a phase two mentality. And in fact, one of the